Um, I want to thank everyone for coming here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. You're in for a real treat with Arnie Gunderson and Maggie. Um, <clears throat> just a quick note about our recent M Mothers for Peace work. We have uh, filed an appeal with the board of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about our contentions, our seismic contention and our um, environmental contention that we presented before the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board in July. Um, they were rejected by the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board. Now we've appealed to the whole um, NRC board. So our <clears throat> wonderful attorney, Diane Curran, from DC is taking care of that work for us. Um, we're continuing to monitor the new developments, I'm sure you've all read about them, about the seismology around Diablo Canyon. I love Bruce Gibson's comment about what it looks like under the plant, because they had always told us that under Diablo Canyon, it's rock solid, it's, it is bedrock, right? And he described it this week as looking like a Christmas fruitcake. <laughs> That's a little bit different. I want you to meet uh, Maggie Gunderson, um, who is Arnie's wife um, from Burlington, Vermont. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm the founder of Fairwinds Energy Education and of Fairwinds Associates. I founded Fairwinds Associates, where we do our paralegal services and expert witness testimony. All the expert witness testimony we did on San Onofre, five reports that helped show the safety violations there. Uh, we testified worldwide, Arnie's testified in Canada. I founded that organization in 2003, and Arnie joined me full time in 2008. In 2008, the Lindelof Foundation, who has written underwritten a lot of our work on decommissioning, asked us to start a nonprofit, and that's when I started Fairwinds Energy Education. Um, we've been doing this work together um, since we were married uh, 37 years ago. That work at that time was for the nuclear industry. We both came from that side. Marnie and I met when I was in charge of public relations at a proposed nuclear plant. So I was the one you'd see on the air telling you that these plants were safe. <laughs> and Arnie was the lead engineer on the project. Oh my God. Wow. Clearly, um, we made a mistake. <laughs> and we both grew up with the Atoms for Peace program and felt that we wanted to turn weapons of mass destruction into plowshares. We thought that atomic reactors was the way to do that. It's not. And we see the complete cycle from atomic power to atomic reactors, and we see the, the terrible decimation of entire um, groups of people that's happening from the mining, uranium mining, and the waste that's left lying and contaminating aquifers uh -huh. and our public water supplies. So um, without further ado, I want to let Barney speak. And thank you. Oh, oh this is an exciting group. <laughs> so thank you. For, thank you for having Maggie and I. Um, and thank you to Mothers for um, arranging this, this leg of the trip. I have to thank Gus Gunderson, that's my, my seven-month-old grandson. Um, <coughs> my, my, my son and his girlfriend live in San Francisco, and this, this started as a four-day trip to San Francisco for Thanksgiving. <laughs> and then, and then the, the groups to the, the north said, hey, why don't you come a week early? And the groups to the south said, hey, why don't you stay a week later? <laughs> if, it, if it weren't for Gus, we, we probably would. Uh, would not have been able to make the trip here. So um, thank you all for coming and, and thank you for, uh, for having us. Um, the, the topic for tonight is uh, are, are we really ready for the big one at, uh, at Diablo Canyon? Uh, you know, this is one of their, uh, <coughs> their stills. This isn't uh, uh, one of ours. But uh, as we go through this, 
Um, this is the only time I've showed this still, but there's a couple of things on it that I wanted to uh, remind you of. First off, even though Diablo started running in 1985, it was actually designed in the late 60s. So plants like Three Mile Island were being built at the same time. Aichi <coughs> was being designed at the same time that, 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 that this plant was designed. Um, <clears throat> that's when I got out of college with a slide book. So, <laughs> so this, this plant, the, the fundamental decisions that were made on this plant were, uh, were made uh, with engineers using, using slide rolls. So um, the one other thing I wanted to point out, um, these, these two uh, things are the nuclear reactors. This is the turbine hall. But over here, often neglected, is where the water goes into the power plant. Um, and out th this um, turbulent area here is the discharge from the power plant. So when, uh, when Diablo tells you that, that don't worry, a tsunami's not gonna wipe out the diesels, um, the diesels are way up here, but the cooling pumps for the diesels are way down here. So we'll, we'll get to that later, but yeah. keep, keep in mind this huge elevation drop between the plant and the, um, uh, and the intake structure. Okay, first slide. So uh, is, uh, can Diablo withstand the, the big one? And, and I think first we have to talk about what is the, the big one. Um, I can assure you that, that, that Moses did not come down from a, a mountain with a, a, a message from God saying, uh, you know, dear California, I promise not to have more than a six. Um, but that, that did not happen. So we, we have no assurance um, from Mother Nature that, that uh, what is the big one? Um, engineers have this uh, concept called the, the design basis accident. And they, they sit in a room and, and, and figure out um, what Mother Nature may, may throw at them. But then in addition, um, they call it the maximum credible accident, but I also call it the maximum cash available. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these plants are designed um, to be competitive with other sources of power. So the only way to really be com uh, competitive is to make sure that your design basis accident is small enough that you can build the plant cheap enough. So what we've got at, at Diablo really goes back to this maximum credible accident, which is really the maximum cash available. Um, there have been five previous meltdowns in my career, and, and uh, many more before that. You know, Santa Susana down in LA is one of the first, um, but uh, in, in England and, and in um, Russia. But there's been five in my career, um, TMI, Chernobyl, and three meltdowns at, at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, all of them were caused by things that were beyond the design basis accident. So, you know, engineers set the bar here, but Mother Nature decided, whoa, we're going to come in with something much more severe. Um, I'll just talk about uh, Fukushima for a split second here. The, uh, uh, the tsunami wall at, uh, at Fukushima was, uh, was four meters high, about 12 feet. And ultimately, they raised it to five meters high. Um, so that's the, that was the design basis tsunami that, that Fukushima could withstand according to these engineers and their design basis accident. The tsunami that actually hit was 45 feet high. So it's no way that a 15 foot wall was going to stop a 45 foot wave. And the, uh, but the design basis accident really should never have been 5 meters, 15 feet. What um, engineers and scientists in Japan knew perhaps for hundreds of years that tsunamis on the order of 45 feet and even higher have hit the west coast, uh, hit the east coast of, of Japan. Matter of fact, in the last hundred years, there's been six or seven tsunamis that have exceeded the height of that tsunami wall. So we had a, a very short period of recorded history that showed six or seven times the design basis would be exceeded. And then if you go up into the hills around Fukushima, there's these, um, they almost look like tombstones, but they, they say, honor your ancestors, don't build below this point. Wow. And those date back to 700. Wow. Wow. So there's essentially a 1500 year history 
that engineers chose to ignore. Why? Money. To make the plant cheap enough to compete. Then these are not uh, Japanese engineers. These were engineers um, based in, in, in San Jose. Uh, General Electric was in San Jose. And the uh, actual engineering was done in uh, Adibasco, which was in downtown Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So th this is an American design that failed. And those same engineers, oh, by the way, were working on Diablo. OK, next slide. There's been 12 seismic precursors in the last 10 years um, that, that, that warrant the, the nuclear industry's attention. Um, there was an earthquake in the Sea of Japan near um, Niigata, um, and there's seven nuclear reactors there. Um, and those are called the, um, the Kashiwajaki Kaoriwa uh, facility. It's the biggest facility in the world. Um, the, what, whatever the earthquake standard was, uh, the earthquake was twice as strong as the engineers anticipated. Uh, four, three or four of the nukes will never start up. Two have started up, and one or two are, are, are still on the cusp. Um, there were thousands of things damaged in those plants, but um, luckily there was no there was no meltdown. So we had seven nuclear reactors at Shibazaki Kariwa that, um, um, that that saw an earthquake that was twice as bad as engineers ever imagined. Um, I was I was in Niigata um, three years ago, and one of the um, scientists came to me and he said, "This happened. The Kashiwazaki Kariwa uh, accident occurred in uh, uh, 2007." So, in um, and he said, "Then this was our last one." And of course, what happened next was Fukushima Daiichi. Now, the um, the earthquake that hit. Fukushima Daiichi was well offshore. And it was a Richter 9. And by the way, engineers don't care about Richter scale. Um, uh, Richter talks about the overall magnitude of the earthquake. Um, when we get to it a little later in the presentation, engineers care about how fast the ground moves under the power plant. And that's that's measured in G, acceleration uh -huh. of gravity. But a Richter 9 earthquake, one of the most severe seen in the last 100 years, hit. Off of, uh, off of Japan, but it was a long way away. So the plant, the Fukushima Daiichi units one, two, three, four, experienced shaking in the buildings twice as much as engineers anticipated. You can see there's a theme here. Um, and um, then the, the last earthquake was uh, North Anna, which is in uh, Virginia. And uh, there, um, the plant was designed for a relatively low acceleration. And even then, the earthquake that it experienced exceeded that relatively low acceleration. It's the one that, that put the crack in the uh, Washington Monument 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. um, now, the people in the nuclear industry will say, geez, that's good. That shows you how robust we build these nuclear power plants. You know, they, they experience forces twice as much as what we designed for them. But the, the real thing is that these, these, these earthquakes happened in 30 years. This is supposed to be a once in 10,000 year earthquake. So if what we thought was unimaginable happened in 30 years, what can really happen in the big picture when you're looking at the big one? So the first point is that, um, that, that the big one is likely not the one that the engineers are, are designing to. The second thing is that on all, five, all 12 of those plants, the engineers hadn't stripped out any of the margins for safety. And what's happening at Diablo is that the margins of safety have been stripped away. We'll get into that next. OK, so uh, I want to talk about the history of seismic change at Diablo. And uh, uh, I came up with the slogan 2468, just how big is the quake. Uh, and, and really, it should be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, but that didn't rhyme. <laughs> the the 2468, just how big is the quake. Um, when, when Diablo was designed back in the, the design decisions on Diablo in 68, um, they thought that the worst earthquake would have a ground acceleration of about 0 0.2 uh, times gravity. Um, mm -hmm. When you drop something, it falls at 32 feet per second per second. That's an acceleration. And that's G. One G is 32 feet per second per second. And um, 
So 0.2 would be about six feet per second per second. What that means is that the Earth would move about six feet in a second if um, it's left to its own desires. So they said, well, let's, you know, this is California, let's double it. So the plant was built, not at 0.2 that they thought, but 0.4. Then came Hosgree, and then came Shoreline, and they said, oh my god, 0.4 is too small a ground acceleration, and let's, uh, we can confidently show that the ground is really gonna move at somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7. And now, just recently, the uh, Hosgree Fault has been shown to connect into another fault, um, the Saint, Saint Gregorio. Saint Gregorio. Saint Gregorio. Saint Gregorio. Sorry. Um, which then connects, um, uh, which then goes north of San Francisco. And now they're talking about acceleration being 20% bigger still. So that's how I get the, the 0 0.8, 2468. Um, so the ground acceleration that uh, engineers believe now that Diablo will experience, this is 0 0.8 kind of acceleration. Yeah, next slide. So, I have to give a shout out to um, someone at the NRC. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you've all heard Dr. Peck, um, heard of Dr. Peck, um, and he's a real hero. Um, he, um, uh, he's the one that brought to light this escalation in seismic design problems without public involvement. And the, the key here is this, <laughs> this 10 CFR 50.59, and what that is, 10 CFR is nuclear law, Part 50 is nuclear reactor law, and then paragraph 59 is the, is the key paragraph. So when I talk about 5059, it's a paragraph in law. And what it says is that the owner of the plant is obligated to get a public licensing process, to get experts outside of the plant and outside of the NRC involved when they make major changes. And the best example I can tell you is, so imagine you buy a pickup truck and you change from regular tires to, to snow tires. That's okay, you don't have to get public involvement to change from a regular tire to a, to a snow tire. We call that like for like, that the, the, the components are close enough that uh, you don't have to get them involved. On the other hand, if you jack it up and, and put these you know, seven foot tires on the, on the vehicle, you have to get a new license. And so that's what 5059 does. It says if you're making little tweaks Changing the tire to the same kind of a tire, you don't have to worry about. But when you put a huge, you know, giant truck tire on a little car, you need to get it re-licensed. And that's what Dr. Peck really focuses on. He, he is not saying that the envelope's not safe. What he's saying is that the process to, that, these plan, that these plans needed to be vetted should have had a public process and brought in people like me or Dave Montgomery or other you know, seismic experts out there uh, to reevaluate the, um, the design. So Dr. Peck's contribution is showing all of the times when the, when the, when 5059 should have been implemented, but, but wasn't. Um, and uh, so my hat's off, my hat's off to him. The, the key when you're working for a utility is that it's easier to get the NRC's forgiveness than it is to get mm -hmm. the NRC's approval. <laughs> and it happens all the time. It's not just the Diablo thing. It happened in San Onofre. You know, they pushed through this, this steam generator that should have had uh, a 5059 review. And whoops, it's here. You want us to send it back? And the NRC says, no, you, you can run with it. And utilities across the country know that the NRC will be much more forgiving and um, if, you, if you ignore the 5059 process. It also happened last month at Diablo. Um, there was a, the latest inspection report out of Diablo shows that, again, they weakened their seismic rules, and an NRC inspector gave them a green inspection finding, which is the lowest level finding. And the issue was that they changed the way they calculate earthquakes from one standard to an easier standard to meet. Whenever you do that, that should automatically trigger public involvement, and the public can get involved in the licensing process. And the last thing Diablo wants, and the last thing the NRC wants, is public involvement in the licensing process. Okay, next slide. Now they tell you not to put much stuff 
on, on a single column. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> this totally violates that, that rule, but that, this is the only, time, the only time I did it. I wanted to look at what's changed at the Ambo since uh, right around 1970. The, the first is the ground acceleration that we already talked about. That they took 0.2 and they made it to 0.4, which is you know, reasonable. But then when Hosby was discovered and Truland was discovered, and this network of faults that goes all the way up to the Cascadian subduction zone. Um, that uh, uh, all of those changes really never were reflected in the design. So how did they do that? How did they build a plane for 0.4 and claim it's capable of sustaining a 0.8? That's the, that's the real question. Yeah. And here's where it went wrong. That they have two things. If, you, if you've ever owned a British sports car, <laughs> they, have, uh, they, they don't call them shock absorbers, they call them dampers. So the, 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 they do the same thing as a, as a shock absorber, but um, the, the Brits call them dampers, and, and engineers call them dampers too. So all the pipes in the plant are held together by shock absorbers. And what they did at Diablo was instead of removing shock absorbers and replacing shock absorbers, they changed the assumption on how that shock absorber would react. And it's called, they changed the damping coefficients. So they made an assumption, I used to teach geometry, and uh, geometry, the, the term assume is, makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> and so they made an assumption on the, um, on the damping coefficients when they built the plant, and they changed those numbers without public involvement and without expert involvement in the process. That was, that was mistake number one that got uh, thrown in there. But the other, the other piece of this is um, uh, there's a lot of technical terms that take the acceleration at the earthquake, wherever it is, you know, if, it's, if it's at the hospital, if it's at the shoreline, and move that acceleration toward, toward land. And at the end of that, there's another process that uh, how firmly attached the building is to the, to the, to the bedrock. So if the building is tightly attached to the bedrock, it's going to move more than if it's loosely attached. And what the Diablo did was they changed those sliding coefficients as well. So the process of getting the, the energy into the building was reduced arbitrarily, um, at least by outside scientists' uh, opinion. They lowered the, um, um, the, the amount of energy that was going to get into the building by tampering, by, by tinkering with the um, with the, the coefficient that the building slid over the land, and then they worked that up into the building um, by changing the damping coefficient. And all of those changes were significant enough that any one of them individually should have triggered a 50-59 review, uh, a public licensing process, and and that didn't happen. And that's really the key that Dr. Peck brings to this. Dr. Peck isn't saying that they're wrong or that they're right, but just that the, there's a process to make that determination. And the, both, and the NRC let Diablo get away with working outside that, that process. So the, uh, the next thing is a, uh, is a term called instrument chatter or relay chatter. Um, we have a good video on the heroin site about this, and, um, but, but what that means is a light switch is essentially a relay goes on and off. Well, in an earthquake, when the building's shaking, those switches turn on and off without any human invention, intervention. And so they, they click on, they click off, and if they were supposed to be on at the beginning of the earthquake, after the building shakes, there's no guarantee they're back in that position. So that's called relay chatter. And the new, uh, the new design at Diablo, um, it doesn't reflect this issue of relay chatter. So when, um, when the big one hits, if a motor's supposed to be on, it's not clear that after the earthquake, the motor will be on. It might be off. And what, what is required at that point is operators frantically running through the plant looking for the right switches to throw. And if you've seen the rubble that was in Daiichi after the earthquake, it's rather difficult to, to make, that, make that run. So, Instrument chatter is a um, often forgotten um, piece 
of the analysis of will the envelope withstand the big one. Um, the next one is, I, I think, the most important one on the page. And it's the, when the envelope was built, it was a 0.4 earthquake. The engineers had to assume in their calculations that when the building started to rock, a major pipe on the nuclear reactor broke. So now you've got measuring a third knee as a nuclear reactor with a pipe out one side and a pipe out the other. If one of those breaks, all of the steam starts shooting out one end and causes the reactor to spin. And now not, in addition to the building rocking back and forth from the earthquake, there's the other forces that are caused by the accident that's created, by the, the, the energy released from this pipe. So when Diablo was originally built at point four, the NRC insisted that the earthquake would induce a major pipe failure that would add energy inside the containment and rattle things around. And the plant had to be built to withstand that. Somewhere along the line, they changed that. And now, with these larger earthquake loads, they don't have to include the twisting motion from a broken pipe. <laughs> and the NRC let them get away with it. So, the, and um, um, the, the net effect of that, of course, I think you can understand that probably the forces are about half as bad as they would be if a pipe were to break in the event of a seismic, uh, a seismic failure of that pipe. So um, that in and of itself, again, should have triggered 5059. The, the other piece uh, came out of uh, Fukushima Daiichi. Um, the, the analysis of the movement on the site assumes the site moves um, uh, together. It, it's, a, it's a consistent single piece. But what happened at Daiichi after the uh, Richter 9, 100 miles away, first off, the entire coast of Japan, the entire east coast of Japan, dropped three feet. I mean, think that's amazing to me that, that uh, an entire country can lose three feet of height just in, essentially in, in an is instant, which of course made the tsunami worse, but, but we won't go there. But <coughs> the other thing that happened on Daiichi was that the site did not move um, at the same rate. And, and now we know that one end of Daiichi is a foot lower than it was before, and the buildings are no longer line up. So remember the site picture we started at the beginning here with, the, uh, uh, with that building down on the ground and that building's up on the hill? Well, there's a, a, an important water pipe that goes up the hill and into those plants to keep them cool. And there's no guarantee, based on what we learned at Daiichi, that the ground will move in such a way that all those pieces on different pieces of earth move together. So we have a, 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 a piece of data on each year to do that. Um, the last two I have slides to talk about um, is the, the structural integrity of the containment is a, is a concern that's come up in the last, uh, uh, the last almost 50 years, 45 years. And the other piece is this loss of the ultimate heat sink. And that was that little building I showed you down by the water at the, at the very beginning. So first, let's talk about containment buildings. There's been five meltdowns in 35 years. Every one of them has had a containment building. So the, the lesson here should be that containments don't contain. Right. And the, the shaking at Diablo will, um, um, will exacerbate especially when you take into effect that, that the NRC no longer requires that the earthquake break a pipe in the process. So <laughs> the loads on the containment are much greater than what the, the Diablo engineers originally um, decided upon way back in the day when they were using slide rules. So let's shoot through the, the, the next slides really Chernobyl. relatively quickly. Chernobyl didn't have a containment. Did it? Yeah, Ch Chernobyl did have the containment. And that's one of those myths. It, it didn't have as robust a containment as, um, uh, as TMI and, and Fukushima, but it did very much, the, the reactor cavity had a containment. Yeah, that's one of those myths that the yeah. nuclear industry put up. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first is the issue of containment integrity at Three Mile Island. Um, this is the fuel that contained uh, at, at Three Mile Island um, after the, the meltdown. Um, 
was taken about 18 months later with a, with a robot. Now, the next slide, though, is the important thing. This, this is the uh, pressure history of, of um, Three Mile Island um, immediately after the accident, uh, out for about, uh, about a, uh, a day. Now, if you, there's one obvious spot on there, right? That's a yeah. pink in the middle. That was a hydrogen explosion. And that was, again, one of these things that was not in the design basics. Nobody assumed that a hydrogen explosion could occur. But the, so that's the, the obvious thing there. But the, the more important thing for my discussion is this. If you look before the hydrogen explosion, the containment was holding pressure. If you look after the, the hydrogen explosion, the containment had ruptured. Mm. And the NRC assumes that containments don't rupture. Um, so this is an, uh, an example of this issue of the design basis is something that people come up with to just keep the bill to. But in fact, when, uh, the, when Mother Nature decides to uh, get angry, it's pretty easy to exceed. This, was a, this is the control room logs from the inside the plant. The plant knew this and didn't tell the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for three days. Well, that's another, that's another lecture. Okay, the, the next one is, the, um, is, is Chernobyl. Um, this is the core at Chernobyl, and it's now something called the elephant's foot. Uh, it was a, a complete meltdown, um, and it's lying in the basement of the building. If, um, and it, this was taken by robots about a, uh, a year after the accident, um, after the disaster. Um, I'm trying to work on my vocabulary. An accident is when an owl falls in front of your window of your car and you hit it. No, but, but each one of these was foreseeable. So I, I, when, you, when, uh, when a disaster strikes that was foreseeable, it's, it's hard to call it an accident. It, it still sleeps, yeah. slips into my lexicon here. So, um, the containment was breached, and this is the blob of material that's now sitting on the floor. If that blob were where I was, we'd all be dead in about five seconds. It, it is so radioactive, it's incredible. The containment failed at Chernobyl, and, um, and now we've got a case where a, a, a hot nuclear core is, uh, is lying on the, on the floor of the, of the building. And then the, the last one is a, is a series of pictures. Um, this is uh, Fukushima, and for those of you who were here last night at Tom Polly, this, this series was, uh, was done by an associate of, of, uh, of Fairlands. And the, um, uh, the containment in the middle is the one to be looking at. This is Daiichi 1, it had already exploded, 2, 3, 4. Um, and I had met with the NRC about six months before uh, Daiichi, and, uh, the advisory committee on reactor safety first. I made the argument that containments can leak. And the, the NRC staff said that containments um, um, don't leak. And of course the staff won. But here's, here's what Mother Nature teaches us about the design basis action. So remember now, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's position on this is that containments don't leak. Okay, click one. Okay, right there is the beginning of a shock wave. Uh, it's called a detonation shocker because it's traveling faster than the speed of sound. And it's incredibly destructive. If a detonation shock wave were to hit the, um, the containment at Diablo, the containment would fail. There's no containment in the world that can withstand that detonation shock wave. So what does the NRC assume? That it can't happen. So don't worry, what you're seeing now can't happen. <laughs> All right, now um, you're going to click 20 times. That's sort of as fast as you go. Yeah, just go. Oh, yeah. Oh, one more, maybe or two. Okay. So that that whole sequence took about three seconds, wow. and the 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 roof and the, the the entire structure was lifted up something on the order of a, of a kilometer, a little less than a mile in three seconds. And that's the power that, that's, uh, in theory, controlled inside a nuclear reactor. Nuclear reactor core is only about 12 feet by 12 feet by 12 feet. And in that, it's a Dac Diablo, has about 5 million horsepower coming out of that block. 
So you can imagine that as long as those horses are running in, 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 in synchronicity, things are just fine. But if one of them trips, you've got a, you've got a real problem in your hands. And that's the problem with all this pressure that can build up inside a container. Um, and, and of course, that's, that's what happened at Daiichi. Uh, I'm, I, I put out, uh, I postulated this detonation shockwave back in, uh, uh, I guess, April, right after the nuclear accident. Uh, Fairruns was the was the first to uh, identify that this was a detonation shockwave, and we had a whole bunch of explosive experts write in saying you stick with that because that really was a detonation, not a deflagration. A deflagration shockwave is slower than a speed of sound, um, and uh, uh, no one has been able to determine what caused that to this day. So this is the other piece of forensic evidence that the containment failed. Um, the big dot in the middle is the spent fuel pool that is um, boiling and mixing with outside air. And you can see that the spent fuel pool air, this blob here, was at around 62 degrees centigrade. Um, that means about 130 degrees. So it was, it, while the pool was boiling, it was mixing with cold air and, and at 62 degrees. That sort of gets your attention, except that this number here is truly frightening. That, that spot there, it's not where the, where the fuel pool is, it's where the containment is. Mm -hmm. And it shows, remember your physics, what temperature is boiling? Boil mm -hmm. That's not steam coming out of there, that's hot radioactive gases coming out of there. So it's another piece of forensic evidence that shows that the, that the, uh, that the containment failed. And this, took, this was taken um, a month after the after the disaster of Daiichi. So the containment was still leaking extensively a month after the, uh, the, the, the plant um, experienced the, the disaster. So the, the NRC, though, on Diablo and every other plant across the country, assumes that when there's, a, there's that word again, assume, um, <laughs> that assumes that when, if there is a, a pipe break, that the containment leaks at 1% for the first day and a tenth of a percent thereafter. Mm. The, um, the, the phone calls on Daiichi between the NRC and the Japanese show that it was 300% per yeah. month. So your plant is being licensed for um, a postulated, a design basis accident with a release rate of 1% of the volume inside that containment in a, uh, in a day, when in fact Daiichi was blowing steam and radioactive gases 300 times more. That's another example of this issue of what engineers decide is the design basis accident versus what Mother Nature really shows us. Okay, next slide. So this, uh, the last point in this argument about what are the big changes in, um, uh, you know, that we now are perfectly aware of that should be factored into Diablo is this um, loss of the ultimate heat sink. Um, this is a satellite picture of uh, the four units at uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, taken a couple days after the, uh, the disaster. And there's, uh, there are cooling pumps, just like that, that building down by the water, there are cooling pumps along the water. And uh, of course the party line on Fukushima Daiichi was that the, the diesels were flooded by this unimaginably large uh, mm -hmm. Tsunami, and because the diesels were flooded, the plant, uh, the plant melted down. That's not what happened. Even if the diesels were on top of the Empire State Building, the cooling pumps along the water, there, 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 and there, were destroyed. Now you know what happens when you blow a, a, a radiator hose in your car. Your engine ceases. So there was no way to cool those pumps from the tsunami. So when you hear Diablo talk about our plants you know, 85 feet above the water and the tsunami could never get there, that's true. But the cooling water pumps are down where the water is, they have to be, and they are not immune to a tsunami. And they have the same effect as if you, you blew up the diesel, because the diesels no longer have the cooling to keep them cool. They seize in less than a minute. So this issue of loss of the ultimate heat sink is a serious one to consider when you're talking to the, uh, the engineers at, uh, at Diablo. The solution to this is not only building the, 
building that wall higher. Um, if you look at the, the intake structure wall, there's kind of a circuitous labyrinth where the water can come in. Um, it has to be a solid wall, and it has to be um, and with intake structures out into the ocean. And the pumps then have to be what we call submersible, they have to be designed to work underwater. I had an engineer, uh, Maggie and I had an engineer when we, uh, that even she started. He was a Japanese engineer, and he wrote to us, and he said, "Ask me why the same accident, or the same meltdowns, didn't happen six miles down the road on Fukushima's Daini." He said, "We learned. We built Daini six miles away, and ten years later, with submersible pumps. But we never backfit Daiichi. Why? Money." They had they had invested the money in that plant and they weren't going to spend another penny on it. So that we get to this maximum cash available, and that's what's really driving these design decisions. So I want to talk now about emergency plans. So the um, the emergency plans will fail. Uh, we talked about five disasters in the last 35 years. Uh, TMI, the emergency plan totally failed. The, um, I spoke with Governor Thornburg uh, last year. He and I were, uh, uh, were speakers at a convention uh, oh. at, at Harrisburg on the 35th anniversary. And I asked him, I said, you know, you were lied to by the utility. He stood back and he paused for about 10 seconds. He said, yeah, I was lied to. And I said, okay, knowing what you know, that uh, there was a meltdown in progress that all these gases were building up and that uh, uh, the, the only barrier in between you and your your citizens and all that radiation was the containment. I said, would you have um, evacuated? And he said, no. That's just the way I am. I wouldn't want to induce a mass panic. Now, that's exactly what happened at, at Fukushima Daiichi, too. The, the people there refused to, uh, the, the Japanese government refused to evacuate soon enough, didn't evacuate far enough, and the people that they did evacuate they sent into the plume of high radiation. And of course, Chernobyl was a, was a total disaster, too. Uh, you know, the Soviets tried to cover it up until the radiation showed up in a, a nuclear power plant's parking lot in Sweden. And guys coming to work in the morning were more radioactive than would be allowed in the power plant. Uh, so the West became aware of it, um, not through any emergency plan, but through uh, detectors in, in, in Sweden. So every emergency plan that had to be implemented so far has failed. So now let's talk about Diablo. And Diablo is even more unique. Next slide. That's a picture of the high school in Harrisburg. OK, so there's a couple of things that you have to uh, know about Diablo and their emergency plan. That when they run these drills, they don't take into account um, the first is there's no guarantee the electricity will work. As a matter of fact, it's better than a 50-50 chance the electricity won't work. Um, now, if you think about this being a, a seismic event that knocks the elbow out, it's very likely to knock out the entire electric grid as well, which is why they tell you to have battery-powered radios so that that may be the only uh, communication link you've got. But you can forget about the reverse 911 calls, um, you can forget about uh, you know, checking things out on the internet. Um, it is very likely that that entire electrical system uh, will fail at the very beginning, uh, when the need is most critical, uh, when you have to evacuate a, a, a nuclear explosion zone. The second is related. Are the traffic lights going to work? No. If there's no electricity, there's no traffic lights. And now you've got people, if I look at the map, there's two ways out of here. There's Route 1, North and South. And, and 101, and people streaming to one or streaming to 101 with no traffic lights. And oh, by the way, they're probably panicked. So the congestion, that, that congestion is not factored in by emergency planners. They just don't think that electricity will fail and that the traffic lights won't work. Um, related is the communication networks. Um, and, and this holds for the, the larger stations as well as what you receive. There's no guarantee that the sending stations will be uh, will be in any 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 better. Uh, and the last is well, we're just. I mean, if you really get this 
big one that Diablo is talking about, or bigger still, um, where's the guarantees that the bridges, the highway bridges, are going to be intact? And I, I, I submit to you they're nowhere near as robust as, uh, and, uh, to withstand that. Look what happened in LA and, and New York, but 20 years ago now, and, and uh, the San Francisco race book as well. Um, the roadways and bridges collapse. So you've got a plan that experts know will fail. And when they test it, they don't make any of these assumptions. The electricity is always on. The um, traffic lights are always working. Communication works flawlessly. And all of the bridges are, are intact. Yeah. And, and if the bridges collapse, then, then we can't get through right. 1 or 101. The right. only way is out of here. That's right. Yeah. But they do, but I've heard PG&E and the Independent Safety Committee talk about a station blackout. They do take into account a station blackout, which deals with the first one that you're talking about. Well, station blackout sometimes deals with the first one, but they deal with station blackout as a station. I'm not worried about will, will a station have electricity at this point. What station blackout means is, um, um, like what happened at Fukushima Daiichi, the, um, the power lines failed and, and, and collapsed. And there was nuclear power plants when they shut down need power to keep cool. And uh, th those, those lines had failed. And that drove them to turn on their diesel. So a station blackout uh, requires the, the emergency diesels to be turned on at the station. But they only have enough electricity to run the, um, uh, to run the station. They don't uh, you know, feed into uh, San Luis Obispo or any of the surrounding towns. So um, station blackout is uh, half of the nuclear accident scenarios begin with a station blackout, which means that the electricity here in town won't work either. Um, but yet none of the emergency plans assume that the, uh, the electricity in the town will fail. Okay, so that's where, um, that's where we're at on, on St. Louis Obispo and the surrounding emergency zone. You've got a plant that's under design in numerous areas, um, and then you also have an emergency plan that's guaranteed not to work in the event of a, in the event of a big one. So where, what I wanted to talk about the, to end this is this okay, two issues. One are the consequences when things fail, and the, uh, the other is the risk-benefit equation that goes into a nuclear power plant. Um, if you go up on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission site, they'll say that, a, uh, um, that there were no fatalities at the Kim Island. But yet, next slide. Um, Dr. Steve Wing, an, an epidemiologist at UNC, University of North Carolina, has shown pretty clearly that the cancer rates up and down the, uh, the Susquehanna River were double what they, what they should be. Now, this, uh, this white line is the Susquehanna River. Here's the power plant. These areas along the river in red and orange are high cancer incidences, and the areas further away in green are low cancer incidences. And what Wing showed was that uh, along the River Valley, cancer was significantly increased. Why? Because on the day of the disaster, there was a temperature inversion, and the gases just sat in the River Valley and ran up and down the valley, but didn't dilute and go up into the hills. So um, Wing is pretty clear, and Maggie and I keep hearing um, anecdotal reports from, I was there, I had lung cancer, I was there, I had my thyroid removed, and none of that data has been systematically categorized. The people that lived in Harrisburg uh, received on the order of, in today's dollars, about $100 million in, in um, awards, um, but in return they had to sign non-disclosure, so uh, their, uh, their health issues and, and deaths of loved ones and stuff like that are, are hidden from the record. So people did die after Chernobyl. Okay, next one. Chernobyl, this is Dr. Alexei Yablokov. He was Boris Yeltsin's science advisor after uh, Gorbachev and the, the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, the, he's written a book that's now published in English uh, called Chernobyl Consequences of, of a Catastrophe. Um, and it's available if you're, if you're interested. Um, We've been able to get it um, uh, for, it's a, it's a thick book of many, many re scientific research projects for 15 bucks. 
Um, there's, there, there is a publisher who wants to get it out there and is just publishing it across. And if you're interested, just send a note to Fairlands and we can, uh, we can get you a, a copy of that. But so Yavapop estimates in his book that something on the order of a million people um, died from, um, from Chernobyl. The um, International Atomic Energy Agency said 40. Not 40 million people. So there's a big difference here between. Now, part of the problem is the next slide. This is Yuri Bendyshevsky. Yuri was a, a famous scientist um, in, the, in the Ukraine who discovered a phenomenon called Chernobyl Heart. Um, he had been uh, giving cesium-137 to the rats and noticed that the baby rats' hearts were deformed. The cesium is a muscle seeker, and in embryo, the, um, uh, the cesium began to attack the formation of the heart. By the time it, the baby rats were born, their, their hearts either didn't function at all, or when they did function, they functioned very poorly. He noticed the same phenomenon in kids, um, and published papers about this thing called Chernobyl Heart. Um, as a thank you, he was thrown in jail for seven years. The, the Ukraine uh, uh, pumped up charges that he had uh, given two of his kids grace that they didn't deserve in return for money. The kids refused to testify. Their parents did. There's no, there was no evidence or anything to support it. Just the testimony of two parents against Yuri. His bank account was clean, etc. And he was thrown in jail for seven years. EU, European Union scientists, got him sprung in three years. But I submit to you, that's still quite a chilling effect on data when you throw scientists in jail for publishing. So I, I frankly have no faith in the data that comes out from the, uh, the IAEA. When Ben Dushevsky got out, he had um, um, all of his papers had been destroyed and all of his. Um, the raw data that he had collected had also been destroyed. So he had no, uh, no ability to recreate it except from memory. OK. Um, and then uh, finally, we've got uh, Daiichi. And I said that uh, uh, Daiichi probably will have something on the order of 100,000 uh, 100, to a million uh, additional cancers. And the IAEA is saying something on the order of 5,000. So again, it's a huge difference, because the IAEA isn't using Ben Dushevsky. He's not, they're not using uh, uh, Steve Wing and others because those, those they choose to discredit. Okay. So the, the last piece here is, you know, the album was coming up to, to be relicensed. And as part of that license process, the NRC is obligated to look at risks and, and benefits. And what they've been able to do is underestimate the risks and underestimate the probability that something can go seriously wrong and inflate the benefits. And that, of course, distorts the analysis to allow the ARGO to be relicensed. Uh, an example of that is um, um, they assume, that word again, that the, um, uh, that the farmland is uncontaminated, farmers go back. If you gotta leave, you leave for a couple days, you go back home, um, et cetera. But the experiences of Chernobyl and uh, Daiichi are anything but that. They, the NRC assumes that a, a human life is worth three million. Um, the EPA assumes a human life is worth six million. So again, if, 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 you, if you look at the cost side of the equation that the Ukraine Regulatory Commission uses, um, they, under, they underestimate the consequences of the problem that goes wrong. Next slide. So the last piece of this is to something called probabilistic risk assessment, PRA, and I call it PRAE. Uh, what, they, what the NRC does, if, well, if you're playing cards and, and you've got you know, two, two cards in your hand, what are the chances of getting an ace? You know, you have four aces and pick two, one and 13. We know that because we know how many cards are in the deck. Well, what the Nuclear Regulatory Commission tries to do is that same technique. They try to figure out the consequences of an accident, but they don't know how many cards are in the deck. And that's the problem. They don't know all the ways that these power plants can fail. And you know, TMI and the Daiichi units are a perfect example of that, not knowing all of the ways that Mother Nature can throw something at you that you won't be able to react. So the probabilistic risk assessment numbers, the chance of, of something serious happening are arbitrarily low too. So if you're predicting that, that, that a meltdown is not gonna happen very often, and if it does, it's not gonna cost very much, 
it's pretty easy to inflate the benefits. What has changed, though, since Diablo went online is that if Diablo were really to compete in a competitive market, it would not be the low-cost provider. There's many alternatives out there that are cheaper. So in, in actuality now, the benefits are nowhere near as great to the society, and the risks are much greater. It's an older plant, um, proven earthquake, big faults, et cetera. So the, the final point here then is that, that is that when you weigh risks and you weigh benefits, uh, if you do it right, your risks far outseed the benefits, exceed the benefits. And then the last one is about Fairlands. Um, I gotta, uh, I gotta thank Maggie uh, uh, again. The the brains of Fairlands, uh, the media strategy for Fairlands, the, the the strategic and tactical approaches we've taken over the years are uh, are hers. You know. I'm, I'm essentially just a talking head. I, I know the technical stuff, but Fairlands got to where where it is today uh, because of the strategy of, of, of my wife. Uh, I think the sirens are now battery powered solar. So they should work, but I'll give you an example where they didn't. When, um, when Hurricane Sandy uh, came up the East Coast and veered into uh, the Oyster Creek plant, it was right in the bullseye. Um, 35 out of the 43 emergency sirens failed. And houses were floating down the street. So it's kind of hard to evacuate when your neighbor's house is in front of you. So, uh, but but in, a, in a perfect world when the towers don't shatter from an earthquake, etc., cetera, um, Diablos are um, uh, battery powered and solar and, you know, and, and get their energy from solar. So they, they should work. But again, in the midst of a, of a crisis, um, there's no guarantee that something else, a, a storm, or the, the shock of the, of the earthquake might, might disturb them. Um, I was in the emergency planning, I was testifying at uh, Three Mile Island, and um, the, the attorney was, uh, was grilling me. And um, I was discussing how the, they, they refused to push the button to, to fire off the sirens. Yeah. And uh, uh, despite the fact that the procedure said, you, you know, if this is exceeded, you've got to evacuate. And the, uh, the attorney, um, his comment to me was, do you expect in the midst of all that confusion, we should, you know, we should read this procedure? <laughs> think about it. And, and I think we have to put ourselves inside that control room in a, in a huge seismic event, something that um, you, know, you and I can, can't even imagine. And, and, um, and think about the chaos that's there. And now, hopefully, when someone notices that things are chaotic, they're not going to say, well, maybe we can cover this up. You know, hopefully, they'll hit the siren button. Uh, but history has shown that the five accidents, that, uh, five disasters, that, uh, five disasters that did happen, they didn't hit the button. So it doesn't matter if you got the, the, the towers or not. Um, that lady in the back there. Um, I, I understand that we probably don't have submersible pumps. And so if the tsunami hit us, then they could take it out. I've always been concerned about what would happen if, if the way you know the water recedes before the wave comes in. Does yeah. that damage the? So that, that's the opposite problem. You know, the, uh, it's called net positive suction head. And if the if there's too little water as the as the wave is receding, either at the beginning or, or after the, the tsunami hits, uh, the pump runs dry. You know, if you have a well, you, you, you understand that there may be water down at the bottom, but there's not enough. Pressure to push it uh, to push it up. Um, so yeah, the, the the pumps have this the, the opposite problem: too little water, and they can't suck that water into the diesels, and uh, and too much, and they can uh, flood the electrics. And would um, that burn the pumps out to not have the water? Below? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, during the um, 
Fukushima catastrophe, I was watching, reading fair winds, and one of the things that I learned was that there's two main uh, models, the uh, Mach 1 and the Mach 2, and one of the things, I, believe, I don't remember, was number four, uh, that had in containment 100 feet off the ground above the containment vessel, and that Indian Point, which is only 11 miles from Manhattan, is one of those. So that you basically have a much larger potential source of radioactive material that could, if run dry, would just spew out uncontrolled. And that was one of the worries about one of the number four or one of the plants. I think. Yeah, um, Fukushima. Uh, I know where you're going with that. There's a couple of, couple of corrections. It's uh, um, the Mark I uh, and Mark II, but all the reactors were Mark I designs. Indian Point like is like Diablo. It's not. It's a pressure reservoir reactor, not a boiling point reactor. But they still have that same problem of the the integrity of the fuel pool. Um, that the NRC does not require safety related cooling of the spent fuel pool. Um, they if if you lose power, uh, they uh, they allow that the the fuel pool can get hotter and hotter and hotter. And the NRC has actually said, well, what we'll do is. If we lose power, um, we'll put a fire truck out there and we'll pump water in to make up for the void. And that's, that's the official party line on, on fuel pool integrity. But um, if the fuel pool were to crack in, in a seismic event, it's game over because there is no way to cool it and uh, all the water is draining out. The, the fuel pool has, um, uh, the NRC has allowed uh, the concentration of radioactive material in fuel pools. To uh, grow over time. When I started, it was five years, and, and the theory was you were going to send it to a, a, a reprocessing plant uh, that that never got built. So the, uh, the, the the vision that I ran, we actually built fuel racks, and we would re rack from five years, and it was well, give us ten years, and it'll be a reprocessing plant. And now they've got thirty five years of, of of fuel stored in these fuel pools. That's the equivalent of seven hundred nuclear bombs. Of radioactive material. Um, the NRC was concerned about uh, the potential of if the water were to drain, what would happen? And uh, they commissioned Sandia Labs to run a test. And coincidentally, the test was actually run two weeks before Fukushima Daiichi. So the, they ran a test on a fuel bundle that had no radioactive fuel in it. <laughs> the, the fuel was uh, simulated by uh, electrical. The last thing you want to do is simulate this thing with the, with the real deal. But they have the right temperature profile on, on zircaloy tubes. And um, the, it caught fire. The, the fuel rod caught fire in the test. Now, um, Fairlands was, uh, was lucky enough to discover this on the web and, and pull parts of the, 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 the series down. And Sandia has since wiped it off their website. Um, but a fuel pool left uncooled will catch fire. And that was the biggest problem here before. That's why the NRC said stay back 50 miles. They weren't worried about the three meltdowns. They were worried about the chance of a fuel pool fire in unit four. Um, and here's an example of where luck came in. You know, the Fukushima Daiichi disasters are really bad. There's no doubt about it. They could have been. Um, destroy Japan, or they could have seriously contaminated the whole northern hemisphere. Um, if um, here's a nuclear reactor, sort of right where my microphone is. On the on the left is a pool for equipment, and on the on, on, on my my right is a pool for the equipment. On the left is a pool for the spent fuel, and between them is a uh, is a divider plate. They were both flooded, and the, the unit four was being refueled. And they were also doing some maintenance on it. So they had all the guts of the nuclear reactor out in the equipment pool, and they had all the fuel over in the spent fuel pool. Um, four days, three days before the, the, the tsunami hit, they were supposed to have taken all that, that, that stuff out and put it back in the nuclear reactor and, and drained the water over there. They were behind schedule. So there was still water in that big pool. Now, when, they, when, when the earthquake hit Daiichi, the building shook so much that four feet of water sloshed out of the fuel pool. Think about that. You know, it's amazing. And it is about 100 feet high. So the building swaying so much 
like four feet of water left, leaving perhaps 10 feet, and the water started to boil down. But the diesels had failed, and there was no electricity. That plate in between had an air gasket around it. And without electricity, the air gasket failed. And the water from the equipment pool ran over into the field pool and saved it. <laughs> That's how close we came to losing Japan. Three days behind on their schedule, and we would have lost Japan. Yeah. So fuel pools are a risk. You know, you're talking to your friends at, at, um, at uh, San Onofre, and, and hopefully your fuel pool will be the biggest risk at Diablo shortly, too. Um, fuel pools remain a risk for uh, the radi radiation, and it remains a risk for uh, the cesium, for instance, for 300 years, and of course the plutonium for a quarter of a million years. But the zircaloy in that, in that fuel is still flammable, um, either by a tourist action or by, just if the water were to drain, um, it would not be a, a, a pleasant sight. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, in the back? Yeah. What, uh, what's the, the latest on the um, core meltdown at Fukushima? I understand it's out of the container vessel, but they don't know oh. where. Yeah. The, you know, I showed you a picture of the core at uh, Three Mile Island. Um, that, that was discovered by robots less than two years afterward. Showed you a picture of the core at, um, at Chernobyl. That was discovered by robots about a year afterward. No one has been able to see the nuclear cores, three of them, at, um, at, at Daiichi. Now, uh, they definitely left the nuclear reactor. And so there's terms, they're not engineering terms, but there's a meltdown which is when the fuel melts and lies in the bottom of the nuclear reactor. Um, then there's a melt through when that fuel is so hot that it, it eats through the steel, the eight inch thick steel on the, on the bottom of the nuclear reactor. And then there's this thing called China syndrome, which would be if it were to, to eat through the containment. Um, I don't think that happened. I think they, they definitely had a meltdown, they definitely had a melt through. Um, but I submit to you it doesn't matter because what's happened at Daiichi was uh, the, um, there's pipes that go into and out of the containment. Not like the plugs in the walls, but, but water pipes and electrical pipes and things like that. And they were never designed to see the high temperatures after the, after the meltdown, uh, the high pressures after the meltdown, and the high radiation fields. So if this were a pipe, it's covered with a, with a plastic resin to keep the, the gases from escaping. All of that plastic ceiling has failed. So whether water's re leaking in or the core has left, the net effect is you've got three nuclear cores in direct contact with groundwater. And it's heading into the Pacific, and of course you're beginning to, to see it over here in California as well. Um, so that, oh, actually, yeah. when a nuclear reactor, we all know that when uranium splits, it gives up a lot of energy. And if that's all that happened, we wouldn't be here today. There'd be no problem with nuclear power. But when it splits these pieces, this, this radioactive rubble are both radioactive and hot, physically hot. So when they'll tell you Diablo Canyon is safely shut down, and we have a transient and the plant safely shut down, what that means is that the nuclear core fuel rods dropped in and the chain reaction stopped. But there's still all of this heat and the radioactive rubble from previous fissions. When a nuclear reactor shuts down, 93% of the heat goes away right away. But 7% remains. 7% sounds like nothing, except remember there's five, 5 million horses running around. Well, 7% of 5 million is still 350,000 horses are still generating heat. So when a nuclear plant safely shuts down, the control runs drop in, but it must continue to be cooled. And these, the, this radioactive rubble uh, gradually slows down the amount of heat that, 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 that it gives off. But um, you know, here we are, uh, Fukushima is almost five years old now, and, they, um, and you can still see steam coming off this thing. So it stays hot for a long, long, long time. When you shut Diablo down, you're going to face that same problem, but all of that fuel is going to be in the spent fuel pool and then eventually in the spent fuel storage. Um, those liners, uh, when, they, when they get out of the fuel pool and into the storage, they're cool enough that they can be air-cooled, but that takes something on the order of five, six, seven, eight years 
Um, so for the first eight years of the post shutdown life of Diablo, you need to have those cooling pumps running or else the cooling, the fuel pool would run dry. What the NRC is allowed at San Onofre, and I am absolutely against it, um, they've allowed um, San Onofre to roll back the emergency plan and they're saying that radiation, uh, if there's a problem in the spent fuel pool, the radiation won't be recycled. Um, so therefore, we don't need an emergency plan. You'll face the same, we had it in Vermont, we lost. Uh, San Onofre had it, they lost. Um, then you'll have it here, and, um, and hopefully mothers are tougher than us. <laughs> but so it, it is a fight that is being fought right now. Between now and uh, 2019, the NRC is changing the regulations, and Maggie and I and Fairwinds are, are trying to change the rules to get the emergency plan in place until the fuel is out of the fuel pump. Now, the, the, the counter argument then is if you, if the utility says that we, we've analyzed and the fuel is not gonna leave a site, so leave us alone, we're not, we're not gonna have an emergency plan anymore. Um, and my counter argument to that is that, okay, then you should renounce your Price Anderson insurance. <laughs> and the Price Anderson insurance is public liability. If it's not gonna leave the site, why hold us liable? And, and I think that's a great argument to, to make in, in, a, in, this, in a situation of collapsing of, of emergency uh, zone. Um, okay. Uh, Before the Hot View Fault was discovered, they thought the maximum ground exposure would be 0.2 Gs. So they said, okay, we'll build a double. We'll build a double to 0.4 Gs. Yep. Now, was that a requirement or was that something they just decided to do? No, there was a, there's a thing called the, the um, shutdown earthquake, the SE. And then there's a thing called the SSE, the safe shutdown this thing. And, uh, and that's, um, uh, that's just what they now, what Diablo calls the double design, which was that they, so they, they doubled it from, from 0 0.2 up to, up to 0.4. Well, when it was re-estimated at 0.7, they didn't go to 1.4. No. Why? It's the NRC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you heard that dialogue, but the question was, you know, that when, when they re-estimated the actual earthquake, at 0.7, uh, it, the, the double design or the safe shutdown effect should be double that with 1.4, which they didn't do. And I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, they it's, it, it, it's absolutely logical. But they couldn't. They couldn't. They couldn't, right. Yeah. They, they, they can't be where they are now, um, in, in my mind. You know, that this, that they, they put so many fudge factors in. They've eaten away at all of the seismic margins that. Um, uh, that if the big one really were to hit, it will fail. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this lady here. Um, I want to ask about the snorkels that they have down there at the intake. I'm sorry, say again? The snorkels at the intake, are you familiar with the snorkels that they have down there? I know. They call them snorkels that they go up high. Yeah. And that's their justification that, it, that it's going to be safe when that tsunami comes in come because under. that they have yeah. these snorkels. But, the, but I don't understand how that works. Um, yeah, that's a really long, complicated discussion on that. But um, the, the net effect is that that, that building hit down by the water will be destroyed by the, by the wave, and the, yeah. the pumps that are within it will, will fail. Including um, the snorkels. Yeah, including the snorkels. Yeah. I just am uh, wondering what you really think in terms of how long until we close this one down. Isn't it the last one in California? And we saw these spent fuel rods sitting there, and We'll be like, yay, it's closed, but what does that really mean? I, I can't postulate on how long. You know, there's, the, 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 there is a clear break in 2014 and 2024 mm -hmm. when the license renewal hits, and, and the public can exert the most pressure at that point. Um, but um, uh, but when, it, uh, when it shuts down, I, I just don't know. It's not going to work if it just happens. Um, no, because you know the plants that are shutting down are merchant plants. Uh, Vermont Yankee uh, didn't have a utility that owned it. Um, the, the, the other example is Kiwani didn't have a utility. Pilgrim doesn't. They were owned and they just sold power on the grid as a gamble. But, but Pacific Gas and Electric is a utility and whether that plant runs or not, it's in the rate base. So the economics on a, on a captured utility plant are much more favorable to keep the plant running than it is for a, a, a merchant plant, where it's a cold financial decision. Um, you know, Pacific Gas and Electric 
is making a return on that plant, whether it runs or not. Um, and, uh, the, but it can be done with the San Onofre. That was a utility owned plant also. So there, there, are, um, there are exceptions. Uh, we are the last one though, right? In yes. California, California, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's five being built in the in the southeast for um, with with socialist governance. <laughs> what happened there is that public service commissions are are incredibly business friendly, um, and they've uh, allowed the, the the people in this is in Georgia and South Carolina. Um, the people in those states are absorbing all the risk, and the utility that owns them, the utility owner, not not a merchant bank, the utility that owns them is. Um, is guaranteed an 11% profit on something north of $10 billion. Yeah, it's, it's more lucrative than any stock market deal you've ever won. And they've also, the businesses in, in Georgia and South Carolina, like BMW and those things, have gotten a special cut on lower rates even though the cost is rising. And who's carrying the rates but the, the weight of that extra cost the people of Carolina and South Carolina. Yeah, I, I uh, had a question concerning there's two other nuclear whistleblowers that I'm aware of that have been recently jailed and one is exiled to Mexico and I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. One's name is Jim Stone and the other one is Dana Dernsford. Mm -hmm. Jim Stone has done a lot of work as far as the Fukushima plant explaining some of the unknowns that you didn't have with yours and then Dana Dernsford has done a lot of work as far as oceanography uh, studies along British Columbia. I don't know if anybody's familiar with them, but no, I'm, the I'm not familiar with them. But the, the Maggie and I, the we, we didn't get into, uh, yeah, we didn't get into our personal okay. story, but we. Uh, yeah, we're personally whistleblowers, and and we can stand by our integrity. Um, yeah, I I, no, no, we we don't know any reliable information about either of those two gentlemen. I have read about them and heard about them received a lot of mail about one of them, and um, I can't verify anything about them or their background. Um, a lot of the mail that one of them was responsible for is quite anti-Semitic and was very vicious to us because we didn't support his assessment of Fukushima that the Jews put um, a bomb in Fukushima, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so, no, I, we don't, you know, I have nothing else to say on that. I don't think they're reliable. But, and on the issue of nuclear whistleblowing, we, our, our story is that and I was a senior vice president in, in 1990 and found some license violations. I told our company president, um, um, and he fired me. And then I went to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they buried my allegations. Um, and then um, Maggie and I went to John Glenn, who was uh, Senator John Glenn at the time, and he fired off an inspector general uh, investigation that ultimately proved us, uh, exonerated us. All of the things that I had found had been covered up, intentionally covered up by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and that the, the inspectors were, were, were uh, taking bribes. Uh, in the meantime, though, we were sued for a million and a half dollars. We went into bankruptcy and foreclosure and, and, and restarted our lives. So, um, but there are, uh, hundreds of stories like ours. I mean, ours, um, we, we survived as a couple, which is cool. And, 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 um, and you know, you start over. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, you don't really have much choice. Um, and, but, but I could fill this room 20 times over with people that, uh, that went through what we did and uh, with, with some pretty awful consequences. And uh, Dave Lockbaum was one of them. Dave, Dave was blackballed by the industry as well. But that's another, that's a story for another night. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, one last question. Yeah. Maybe you could yeah. add um, the question from behind me. She was saying when Diablo does shut down, it will shut down. We can't say when, but it will shut down. That's right. And at that point, uh, Mothers for Peace will still be there. And you might want to say a word about safeguarding the radioactive waste after yeah. it's shut down. I mean, it's, when it's shut down, at least some of the uh, hazards are gone, but you still have the waste. It's a lot yeah, you know, the, the, I, I mentioned that the, after the fission stops, 93% of the, the heat and the energy you have to guard against is over. 
So when, once the plant shuts down, you don't have any more fissioning. But you still have that residual heat that lasts for six, seven, eight years, and you still got the residual radioactivity that lasts for cesium for 300 years and for plutonium for a quarter of a million years. So that waste right now has no home. So it's, it's going to stay on the, on, you know, it's at San Onofre now, and it will be in, in your backyard for as long as it takes for scientists to discover a good place to put it. The, the, the industry's position is Yucca Mountain is the place to send it. Um, Yucca Mountain was not a scientifically identified site. It was a, um, um, it was a um, political decision. And when the bill was written to choose Yucca Mountain, the bill was called the Screw Nevada Bill. Uh, because they didn't have many people, and Harry Reid was a was a pup at the time, you know. And now, of course, Harry Reid is, is is the ranking member on the on the minority side, and things have changed. But the scientific basis for Yucca was never there; it was a political decision. So, will it be Yucca? I don't know. Will it be somewhere else? I hope so. But until that decision's made, um, that waste will stay at Diablo and San Onofre and and all over the country. Yeah. All right, well, thank you.